I'm delighted to be moderating uh, our final panel of the day on fairness, bias, and race in an algorithmic world. Uh, so when you hear uh, artificial intelligence, uh, depending on how many Westworld uh, or Black Mirror episodes you've recently binged, uh, you may conjure up either some utopian or dystopian um, scenario for the world. I think in practice, the bias that's baked into our machine learning models and our medical machine learning models may be much more subtle, but it's just as worrisome at scale. Um, so we're meeting, you know, we're at a meeting about precision medicine. So I think it's worth noting and starting off um, with, with the observation that the term bias is, is very overloaded, uh, where it can mean something uh, that's traded off with variance in a statistical sense, uh, more colloquially something that is uh, uh, prejudice that's embedded into a particular model. Uh, it can refer to individuals, it can refer to communities or societies. Uh, so we're lucky to have three experts in machine learning and medicine to help us unpack uh, not only the different types of bias in clinical AI, but also tell us um, how we can uh, hopefully uh, fix and address some, some sources of those bias. Um, so as with the prior panels, I've requested that the three panelists introduce themselves uh, and to share some of their, uh, their initial thoughts on uh, what we can do to ensure that uh, clinical machine learning is, is deployed equitably. So Dr. Pearson, could you, could you start us off? You want me to go from here? Whichever. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. No, that's fine. I can talk from here. Um, cool. All right. So I will, to some degree, read my remarks. You'll forgive me. I prefer to be precise when talking about precision medicine. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. I'm Emma Pearson. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Cornell Tech and of population health sciences at Weill Cornell Medical College. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. This is my first in-person event in 18 months, and it's actually a little bit moving to actually be in person. Maybe I'm just going soft in my old age. Um, so I am a child of precision medicine. I was born with a rare genetic condition a few decades earlier. I would not have survived. I now am an adult who studies precision medicine, specifically uh, machine learning in healthcare applications. Um, and I've spent the last few years studying bias uh, in algorithms. So I'm deeply aware that algorithmic approaches are no panacea to inequality and indeed can exacerbate it um, if improperly applied. But in spite of this, I would characterize myself as an algorithmic optimist. Um, and to illustrate why, I'm just going to tell you a brief story about some of our work using machine learning to better understand racial inequality and pain. You can find this published in Nature Medicine a few months ago. Um, so in our work, we study knee osteoarthritis, which is one of the most common causes of disabling pain in older adults. Many people listening to this talk will develop it if they haven't done so already. And there's racial and socioeconomic inequality in osteoarthritis pain. Underserved populations experience greater pain. And the interesting mystery is that this gap persists even when we control for how severe the doctor thinks the disease is, as measured by looking at an x-ray of the patient's knee. So like, why is this? Why is there this pain gap? One possible explanation is that there are factors totally outside the knee, uh, like greater life stress, which cause underserved populations to experience greater pain even when their knee disease is no more severe. And that's why controlling for the doctor's assessment of knee disease doesn't do that much to narrow the pain gap because it's something outside the knee entirely. But there's a second possibility, right? And that's that the doctor is missing something, that there's additional signal to be found in the knee that conventional clinical severity scores are not capturing, and if we could capture it, we would narrow the pain gap. And why is that second possibility plausible? Well, our conventional scores are to, for knee osteoarthritis are based on studies conducted decades ago in heavily white British populations. So it's plausible, right, to reference you know, all the discussion of environment that we had in the first panel, that these scores might not capture all the features that are relevant to pain in modern and more diverse populations who live and work very differently and thereby suffer a very different set of environmental and occupational risk factors. So we use a deep learning approach, machine learning approach, to see whether there's additional signal in the knee that the doctor might be missing that might explain underserved populations' higher pain. And we train basically this deep learning algorithm to try and predict pain from knee x-rays. And we find that our algorithm does in fact find additional signal in that x-ray for predicting pain, and that when you control for this signal, you can narrow the pain gap and better explain inequality in pain. This suggests that traditional measures, traditional clinical severity measures, fail to capture all the physical health features that would explain underserved groups' greater pain levels. And because these severity measures influence who gets surgery, underserved groups may be under-referred for surgery. But using an algorithm, we can identify this hidden signal, understand pain in a more equitable way, and potentially create tools which help allocate surgery more equitably by identifying patients with real knee damage who might have been missed by traditional measures. 
So this work points to the potential of machine learning to reduce inequality in healthcare. It's intrinsically a machine learning project, right? You can't do this with anything other than a convolutional neural network. They've supercharged our ability to understand medical images, and that's a technology we've only had for like 10 years. So machine learning gives us an unprecedented ability to expand the frontiers of medical knowledge, and if we choose to focus that ability on groups that we've previously been blind to, we have the potential to make medicine more equitable. This project also showcases some of the things we need to leverage that potential. For example, it relies critically on a racially and socioeconomically diverse patient population to train the model on in the first place, and we show that this is important to performance. It also relies on training the algorithm to listen to the patient by trying to predict the patient's pain rather than merely trying to replicate historical clinical measures that may be biased or incomplete. And so the choice of prediction target is also critical here, as it is in every machine learning task. And I think perhaps the biggest lesson of this work is that in evaluating algorithms and algorithmic performance to improve equity, we always have to compare to the baseline world in which we currently exist, the world which would exist without the algorithm. And that world is deeply unfair and reliant on human decision making, which is often biased and noisy. It's not like our algorithm does some magically fantastical job of predicting pain, right? But we're comparing to a baseline understanding of pain, which is very bad, and to a severity score, which is decades old, and it's just not that hard to beat those baselines. Please understand that I'm not insulting clinicians here. I have deep respect for them, in part because my little sister is a clinician, and I'm kind of scared of her. Uh, but every, every clinician I've ever spoken to recognizes the deep gaps which persist in our medical knowledge. So this is the somewhat twisted reason I remain an algorithmic optimist, because I have studied human decision making too, and in many ways, like as bad as algorithms are, it's even worse. Um, and I want to conclude just by saying, I think this, this work also illustrates some of the obstacles we need to overcome to close the gap between algorithm in an academic paper and algorithm uh, helping real patients. I very much agree with our keynote speaker's opening statement on like, cute paper, how are you actually going to help people, right? Um, so so what, are, what are some of these challenges? One big challenge that remains is interpretability, and I suspect we're about to, about to hear a bit more about that. Uh, how do we figure out exactly what the algorithm is looking at when we're dealing with high-dimensional nonlinear your models and make sure that it's nothing insidious. Uh, even if we can figure out what it's looking at, how do we determine if that's like an acceptable thing for an algorithm to be using? Like we just heard a lot about like race and can we use it in these scores and like what are the harms of doing that? You know, medical community remains very undecided um, on that. Another big challenge is how do we create algorithmic interfaces that actually work well with humans? So if we wanted to roll out this tool to actually help human clinicians, how do we sort of build something which is actually helpful to them? And then finally, when we are rolling out this algorithm, you know, how do we how do we deploy it in a way which is gradual, which we can be sure is robust across different patient populations, different hospitals over time? Uh, how do we do so in, in, in collaboration with patient communities, particularly with underserved patient communities who have often been very much sidelined in, in these sorts of processes? So uh, those are some of my thoughts. Very much looking forward to the subsequent discussion. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. Dr. Gassemi? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Marzia Gassimi, and I'm a professor at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science and uh, the IMS department. Uh, I'm a new hire. I just moved this summer. And uh, piggybacking off of Dr. Pearson's comments, uh, I think the big thing that my lab group tries to focus on is doing what I call healthy machine learning, which means machine learning that is robust, private, and fair in health data. That's very hard to do actually, remarkably hard to do. And it's because often, and there are rare exceptions actually like uh, the work that Emma just spoke about, um, very often we're using human data to train models. And uh, that data is very biased as we've heard over and over again today, especially if it comes from very targeted patient populations. I'd also like to briefly point out that uh, in the machine learning community, we're not really in a space where we know how to work with data that is that biased right now. And what I mean by that is that machine learning is built often on this idea of exploiting patterns and similarities, right? And then you want to remove things that are not part of the pattern. You want to remove the outlier or the noise. And so uh, you may have heard of differential privacy, which is a, um, a framework for ensuring that any individual that is too unique doesn't pull a classifier's output or gradient around too much 
as you're going through the neural network training process. So it's something that the census used, the U.S. Census. Uh, it was used by, it's used by technology companies like Google and Apple to ensure that no user who maybe is typing something a little bit too unique, maybe I don't always type duck, duck, go, I type duck, duck, potato. That's too unique. It would be really weird and freaky if it suggested that to somebody else, right? That's, that's very unique to me. It's not a common thing. And so in a similar way, you want to protect the output of a model that somebody might be able to audit that might reveal something about a person who is too unique just because they're the only person of their ancestry and their age in their zip code. So while for most people it might be okay to abstract to that level, maybe it's not okay for me because there aren't many people who are my ancestry, my age, and my zip code. And so we tried doing this actually. We took a very common task in the machine learning community, predicting mortality in the intensive care unit. So you train a model every year using all previous years. So for example, the model for 2008 is trained on data from 2002 to 2007, and then tested on 2008, and so on, right? And uh, usually models, especially recurrent neural networks, do very well at this task. We're talking AUCs between, you know, 0 0.85, 0 0.9. And we found that when you add differential privacy, it really tanks that performance to be almost no better than chance. It really affects the performance. And then we looked at who, uh, whose performance is really dropping. And we were a little surprised that it was all the minority patients. And specifically, it was black patients. And it's because as you're technically, the t the, it's working as designed. Like the technical part of ensuring differential privacy says if you are too unique when you pull the classifier around, noise and clip the effect you have on the gradient. Who do you think looks too unique? Who is, noise, who is being noised and clipped in the gradient during the learning process? And so it's not as if there was something uh, incorrect. It was working as designed, and it's because it was designed in maybe another application where noising and clipping a person's data doesn't make the model not work for them in a mission-critical way. And so when we use technologies that in machine learning are common or state-of-the-art, you need to think very carefully about what that means in a human context, because that data point is not a noisy sample of a vehicle speed. It's a human. And maybe they just look different than other humans. And we've seen repeatedly in uh, the work uh, in my lab, that's, it's been very shocking to me, that when you apply machine learning principles, because it's designed to exploit averages, commonalities, patterns, you repeatedly, by design, exclude or remove data from people who don't look like a majority. And it's very hard to catch these problems. And so you might say, well, why don't you just audit your models? Why don't you just check that for every subgroup, for black women, for Asian women, for uh, Native American men, every subgroup that we have in a defined list, you could give me one, I can audit it and make sure that the model doesn't perform significantly worse for any one subgroup. But it's not that simple, especially when we're dealing with high capacity models that like humans can post hoc rationalize their decisions but it's not really getting at exactly why a decision was made, it can be hard to figure out where that bias is. So for example, we've trained models uh, that you may have seen in the New Yorker or other popular press called uh, contextual language models or transformers. And these are language models that can generate text that looks like a human generated it. And when we ask the model to complete a sentence that starts with blank patient was belligerent and violent, patient sent to, if we say white or Caucasian patient was belligerent and violent, the model completes the blank with patient was sent to hospital. If we say African, African American, or black, the model completes this sentence with prison. And this is a contextual language model that was trained with PubMed abstracts. It's a publicly available model called Cybert. And that would have been very hard to find. It's not like there's a standard audit process to identify that that difference would have occurred. And I think even more concerning is the fact that uh, the model that is publicly available that we are seeing these differences in is being used. People use Cybert. They download this model and they use it to complete notes, power chatbots, answer questions. 
And so these, uh, these technologies, I think we are not aware of how uh, able they are to do as we do, not as we say. And so they end up reproducing and exacerbating these biases that are present in human behavior without our knowledge often and without a clear audit path. And so while I'm also, I think, an optimist about the possibility of doing better than humans do now, I do think that we need to have a very holistic view of all the different technical levers that we may think are just the, the most modern, most state-of-the-art, best thing to use, but actually don't work well for our particular setting in health and health data. Thank you, Dr. Gassemi. Dr. Armandia? Thank you. And this is, is also my first event in 18 months or so in, in person. I'm so glad to, to see everybody here and to have everybody um, online as well. So I'm uh, Ana Ormenya. I'm the Senior Director of Product at Metadata Solutions. Um, and my work focuses mostly on product development using data and AI, particularly centered around evidence generation um, within our Acorn AI division. And for those of you who may not know metadata, we are very fortunate to have access to some of the world's largest clinical trial data repository for all of the physicians in the audience or anybody who's run a clinical trial. You might have heard of RAVE EDC or the electronic data capture. Around 60% of industry trials are captured in our platform in some way or another, um, which then leads to a data act asset that we have that we can use um, that has around 20,000 trials representing around 7 million patients or so across the spectrum of disease. And then with explicit permission and uh, from, from our customers and after anonymization and de-identification and, and a very long protracted process, we can then use this data to train models that can help us inform the trials of tomorrow, both um, in ways of benchmarking and better planning a trial, better picking sites, um, uh, understanding patient burden, um, and, and a number of other things. We use this historical trial data to build synthetic control arms, um, and we can use it to explore scientific questions that can help really in the scientific design of, of a future trial. As you can all imagine, and as we've heard, historical data sets uh, have, can have challenges and, and the work that we have done historically, um, medicine evolves and the way we plan trials evolves, the way we have uh, thought about diversity, thought about race has evolved. Um, so additionally, beyond my day job, I am a member of Metadata's um, Diversity in Clinical Trials Committee. And this is a cross-functional committee that we've built um, that really has as a mission to help life science industries have more representative trials. We know that race and ethnicity affect how patients respond to drugs as a general holistic statement, um, but we also know that participants in clinical trials are mostly white, um, and there is, there's huge discrepancies that come from that. Um, so, as Part of what, what I mentioned both during my day job and the Diversity and Clinical Trials Committee, I spend a lot of my time thinking about the ways that AI and machine learning can both uh, help and make our jobs harder in ensuring a more equitable healthcare system. So I have three big thoughts that I'd like to share and I'd like to talk about and, and reflecting both what we've heard from the panelists today or right now and the whole entire day. But something I'd, I'd like to state pretty clearly is that bias is, is really inherent in the algorithms we build because we're humans and because our human-built machines are building these algorithms. And that could be bias in, in any way, shape, or form, and we can talk extensively about it. Um, because we are imperfect, we have imperfect data sets, and we uh, have to acknowledge that there's going to be bias that comes with them. And I strongly believe that how we deal with this bias is ultimately what impacts patient uh, care down the line. To that end, I think we need to talk openly about the bias in our algorithms and about the bias in the data sets that we are using to build those algorithms. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, to a point that was made earlier today a number of times, communication and education 
is key to how we deploy these algorithms, particularly in how they are interpreted, both by the physicians that will take these on and then uh, use them, as well as the patients that are receiving the results and, and kind of trying to understand how their race, how their, their zip code is, is being used in that regard. And then I think the, the last point here, and something we can all agree on, um, is that one of the ways that we do reduce bias is by increasing the, oh, <coughs> sorry, um, is by increasing the diversity of the teams that develop the algorithms, test the algorithms, utilize the algorithms. And we've talked about this as community-based science, as team science, as even, even thinking about the, the developers and the people that are actively sitting and looking at the data. To understand the bias that is going into the data sets, you need to be able to, to interpret it and to think about it. And to the earlier points that were made, oftentimes that's very, very hard. It is a thousand million times harder if everybody looking at the data has had the same experiences and has looked, um, has experienced medicine in the same way, has experienced um, their life in the same way. So I think these are these are some interesting points that can lead to to some discussion. I look forward to it. Great. Uh, so so thank you, um, thank you all. I think that was uh, already very very stimulating. Uh, I, you know, it, it strikes me that. All three of you talked about bias in data, but I think um, Dr. Gusemi, especially your example around differential privacy, uh, I think points to a larger conversation that is happening in the broader machine learning community, which is that while we, I think, maybe widely acknowledge bias in data, uh, that there is often bias in modeling choices or in algorithmic choices that may appear neutral or that may be marketed as neutral, uh, but, uh, but might actually um, you know, put your thumb on the scales for how your, how your model learns uh, what, it, what it learns. Um, so uh, you know, this, this leads me to, um, to, uh, to pose the following question. Um, this is a conversation that I think is now very prominent in the broader outside of medicine uh, machine learning community. Um, you know, specifically for this issue, uh, what do you see as uh, fundamentally different about that conversation around modeling bias, algorithmic bias, and, uh, and how it's different than data set bias in the medical machine learning community versus the broader, uh, broader machine learning community? And I think it's a perfectly acceptable answer to say, not much, uh, although I suspect that, uh, that there is much that is, that is different about how this, um, how this conversation is, uh, is addressed and how it's unfolding in medicine. So maybe Dr. Gassemi, if, if you can start yes. us off. I, I have a recent unfortunate experience with this. Uh, there is a, a large machine learning conference. It's sort of our, our big uh, publication venue. And they took the, I think, fantastic step uh, these past couple of years of adding uh, ethical reviewers. Um, so you uh, have a paper and it's reviewed by three technical reviewers under a short timeline. And they speak to you know, the veracity of the claims and you know, the, the presentation of the material, whether it's a good paper technically. And then they can also ask for an ethical review if they think that, uh, you know, I'm a technical person, I'm evaluating this technically, I want somebody else who has some experience um, to uh, give it an ethical review. And so I am an ethical reviewer uh, for this large machine learning conference this year. And there's a paper that was flagged as needing an ethical review. And so, uh, you know, I, I looked at the, the technical review first and it said this is a great paper, it does this uh, interesting technical thing with machine learning, really great results. Um, I think it might be an ethics review. And I looked at it and said, oh, wow, this, this is a terrible paper. Uh, you know, it's, it's technically beautiful, but would honestly, I can only imagine it being used for bad things. I can't imagine a single positive use case for this technology that you're proposing. Um, and so I submitted that. And the, um, the, uh, the people who sort of look at these responses responded back and said, well, but it is a strong technical paper. And uh, so they called for a second ethical reviewer, somebody I, I don't know, uh, you know, another person. And that person looked at it and said, oh, wow, this is terrible. Like, you really shouldn't release this. This is really bad. And the, the, uh, the again, like the, the area chairs were like, but it's strong technically. We think we're going to let it in. And we're like, but, mm -hmm. but wait a minute, you know, like, 
you called us, you know, we, we didn't call you here. I do think in the broader machine learning community, there is a pushback against too much, um, I don't even know what the right term is for, because I'm part of the touchy-feely people, right? So, but I, I think it's actually something sort of dismissive like that, right? There's a sense of why are you bringing your ethics or your feelings or your politics or your experience into my math? My math is just math. My technology is technology. And I am not using it for something bad. You may be envisioning that it could be, but I'm not doing that. I'm creating this thing. I don't think that that is uh, the way the conversation often goes in clinical settings. And I actually think that the, uh, the, the prominence of many uh, machine learning health examples has brought this perspective back into many machine learning settings where everybody was sort of aware of it, but there was a large group that sort of said, but is it really that bad? And then many of the examples of real, um, truly improper use of technology that on its own maybe isn't bad, but if you take one extra step of thought and think, how exactly are people going to use this? It's very clear that there's only negative use cases and there's, there's vanishingly a few positive things you could do with technology. So I do think that there has been um, a push in machine learning, a wide push, and then now maybe a little bit of a pushback saying, hey, don't, don't police us too much. And I, I don't think that that's quite the same. I think it's sort of the opposite in, in many medical settings where um, there is a big drive to think of things ethically first and like don't, don't move too fast, don't push the technology too hard because we don't know what will happen. Um, I, and I think that you know, balancing those two perspectives is challenging. Um, yeah, so I guess I would say, okay, so how, how is health specifically different? Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I would first say is like, I do think one of the great things about math is that a lot of the core algorithmic fairness results and sort of uh, modeling bias results do go through. For example, there are sort of core impossibility results, like if you want this desirable fairness property, you mathematically cannot have this other one. And those apply agnostically to all decision makers, to all domains, you know, that that is, I wouldn't know, it's maybe not a nice thing because it means we're doomed to be biased, <laughs> but it is a mathematically powerful and elegant thing. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, but, but I also think that there are important social differentiators that make health, health, health as a domain uh, different. I think one thing, uh, as we're all hopefully aware of at this point, is that you know, the way we talk about variables that can be used in algorithms um, is, is different in health from other domains. So for example, race, like you wanna use race in a criminal justice predictive risk algorithm to say nothing about the ethics of criminal justice predictive risk algorithms, but if you want to use race and those algorithms specifically, basically in the United States you can't. They're subject to strict scrutiny. It's immediately a non-starter. In contrast, in health, you know, in some algorithms, people have been doing this for decades. Now it's becoming controversial. But like the social context and the way we think about those variables um, is, is quite different. So I think sort of specifically which variables are okay to use or not okay to use is, is different in health than in other domains I have, have considered. Um, and I, I think another thing in health which I at least find uniquely diff difficult, I think, is that the interpretability challenges around assessing bias can be, I think, particularly difficult because you're like, I'm looking at this x-ray and like, no one really understands like what the x-ray is. You know, we can't necessarily articulate even in like English the salient features and let me like say whether some of these features are insidious, right? That's a lot harder than being like, my computer vision algorithm knows this is a golden retriever because it has big ears, right? Like we can like articulate all that. And so I think, I think some of the interpretability challenges become particularly stringent in health due to sort of the very high dimensional nature of the data and like the fact that we just like don't understand that well how well these biological systems um, work. And, and I think you're also getting at the, the labels, right? That the labels may be fundamentally faulty and the disagreement from doctor to doctor yes. um, uh, and from you know guideline to guideline may really complicate any assessment of how robust a particular model is, unlike the golden retriever example. Although there's probably uh -huh. well, some no, nuance like, there. Yeah, golden. Yeah. I mean, image yeah. data sets and other domains have have labeling errors too. So and and target target. That's a, that's a problem in criminal justice too, right? People trained on arrests, they really care about crime. Oh my gosh, arrests are racially biased. Now we have bias in all our criminal justice algorithms ever. So yes, targets are important, but I, that's a, that's also yeah beyond. I all. think the 
that point is uh, really good because one of the things that I think shocked me when I first started working with health data is that you can have two experts that have both trained for a decade. They are both experts. They acknowledge that they are both experts and they can fundamentally disagree about a label. There, there are not, in my experience in other domains, experts that train in a specialty for a decade and fundamentally disagree on the classification of a, lab of a label to a data sample you present to them. Yeah. It's very hard. And so then there's a conversation about, is it that one is biased? Is that our knowledge are, is biased? You know, what, what, where is this coming from and how do we address it? That's not something that I think we can address with technology, but if it's there and it's there for a reason, a, a biased reason, we won't even be able to audit it. We don't know how, right? It's, it's not something that you can ask for and then look at and see a similarity because there is disagreement. I think this really gets at sort of the, the art and the science of medicine. And they're really coupled together in, in some way, shape, or form. And it comes down to the two experts. That are to, it's an excellent example. If they agree that they're both experts, they label differently. What were their training data sets? How did they train? Who did they train on? What were their experiences? It, it, medicine is vast. Humans are different. We're in all sorts of different conditions. And when you try to reduce that to a particular data point or to a particular set of fields, even if you have hundreds of thousands of patients, um, the complexity gets really hard really fast. I think also one thing to remember is that in machine learning, we're usually focused on detecting things that are like normal. We look at lots of normal views of normal dogs doing normal dog things. And in medicine, we have a little bit of data on sick people and a lot of data on really, really, really sick people. And the sicker you are, the more data we have on you. We have very little data, if any at all, on anybody who is healthy. And so, whereas in machine learning, again, we're, we're, these models and these algorithms and these technologies are built on finding similar patterns in sort of a normal, what is a normal distribution for this thing I'm modeling. And in, in medicine, it's, it's anomaly detection in anomaly detection. Not only were you sick enough for me to see you, now there's a really bad event that's happening while you were sick enough for me to see you. And, and that's just, it's a very different setting. So I, I, th I think those are, um, they're, they're fantastic points. Um, and I think uh, there's a whole set of issues that we haven't touched on, on data access in the main, you know, the mainstream machine learning community versus the, the medical machine learning community um, that I, I think also present uh, challenges around, around validation. Uh, maybe I'll switch gears just a little bit um, to the last question that was posed to the EGFR panel uh, that we, the kidney function panel that, uh, that we just had, uh, which was around interpretability. And so in that instance, it's a regression equation where there's a multiplier and it's fit from data of measured GFR against serum creatinine and a set of demographic variables, um, race, age, and sex. Uh, and it's fully clear that 1.16 or you know 1.21, 1.22 um, is a multiplier for the same uh, the same serum creatinine value to end up with a different estimated GFR uh, for uh, for African Americans. Uh, now you've I think uh, several uh, several panelists have, have touched upon how uh, the situation can be quite different in a uh, high dimensional, um, you know, deep representation, uh, very complicated and hard to scrutinize uh, machine learning model. I think chest x-rays were just mentioned. Um, and I think Dr. Gassemi, you're a co-author on that recent paper. Um, so maybe you can, um, maybe I, just as a, a question to pose to all three of you, um, how do you see this intersection between medical equations that are traditional regression epidemiology um, you know approaches where we uh, we are uh, arguably much more aware of what our covariates are we've specified them and then we know how they impact um, what we uh, what we use uh, to, to guide out uh, to guide downstream care decisions versus in machine learning where uh, evidently, in a chest X-ray that is very, very blurry, um, we can learn a great deal about uh, about an individual. Um, so, um, how do you think about that? How, what does that mean for the the our ability to actually uh, to validate these models across across groups? Uh, so, I, I maybe tell us about that result too. Yeah. 
Uh, so you may have seen, as, uh, as Dr. Benry is uh, alluding to, that uh, there was a paper recently that came out that has a very long author list of, um, I think it's all very uh, cool radiologist doctors and me. Um, and what happened is I, I had some uh, collaborators uh, and a, a postdoc that had, ha they had a result where they said, you know, Marzia, we can, we can predict race in these 700,000 uh, chest X-ray images, self-reported race. So a patient says, I am black, I am white, I am Hispanic, I am Asian. Um, and then that's recorded in the EHR. And we can predict that um, with a held out test AUC of 0.9. And just so you know, that's lat no. You can't predict somebody's going to die with a held out test AUC of 0.9. There's no way. It's a, I, told, I told the student and the postdoc, like, it's a bug. Rerun it. And they reran it, and they got the same result. And then I said, well, I'm going to look at your code. And so I looked at their code, and it was fine. And then um, we called another collaborator in, at Georgia Tech because we said, well, none of these models have a large African-American uh, population to look at. And so maybe it's just so... Again, like the, the, we were just kind of trying to figure out what was going on. Um, we said, uh, maybe it is the case that the populations that we're dealing with and the specific data sets we have are so specific because the minority populations are, are small. And so there's something that relates them. Um, and we reproduced it in the Emory data set, which is uh, half African American. And uh, then we had some collaborators from New Zealand who had a data set. Like, it's, it's reproducible. It's reproducible. It's reproducible. It's reproducible. And even more concerningly, uh, every radiologist, so we, we sat down on this call, and uh, I told them all, okay, give me any reason you could think that this is happening. I want all of them, and my graduate student will just test them all. Uh, he stopped doing, two of my graduate students just quit their own research for two months because I was just going crazy. I was like, there's no way. There's a, there's a proxy, there's stenography, something is happening and I want to know what. And so the radiologists were like, maybe it's bone density. No, if you white out the bones in the x-rays, you can still predict it. Maybe it's body mass index. No, if you control for body mass index, you can still predict it. Maybe it's body habitus, like other, you know, things about, no. If you control for that, you can still predict it. It's no, 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 no. Every crazy theory that they had of like, maybe it's leaking through in this way. And I want to stress to you, this is not genetic identity. It's not as if we recorded their, their genome somewhere and there's like a SNP marker. This is self-reported race. It's crazy. It is crazy that you can predict this. What's even crazier is you can, pardon my French, you can bandpass filter the out of this x-ray until, yes, I know, <laughs> wrong, wrong language. You can bandpass filter until it looks like nothing, like visual noise. And you can still predict self-reported race in a held out patient set with remarkable performance. It is shocking. And um, I had a, uh, a, another machine learning colleague tell me, well, why is this such a big deal? Because I was telling him, I'm going insane. Like, I, I need to figure out what's going on. This is crazy. And he said, why is it such a big deal? And I tell you why it's a big deal. It's because clinicians can't do it. They can't do it better than chance on perfect images. I know, I tested them. Poor guys on the call. Um, they, they're, very, they're very wonderful and understanding colleagues of my, you know, two months of insanity. Um, they, can't, they can't detect it. It's not, it's not visible. You can't tell, right? We, we had them all try. You cannot tell, okay? They can't even imagine what you could use to tell. And this model, a, a convolutional neural network, can tell perfectly even when you degrade the image to, again, nothing more than what looks like visual noise. This is multi-center data. It can't be the x-ray machine. It can't be, and we test it. It's not bone density. It's not the way they're positioned. It's not, uh, you know, their weight. It's not, we even thought maybe it's something, maybe the world is just so horrible to every person who self-reports race as black that just their general like physical condition degrades more rapidly and that's uh, apparent on the x-rays when you can but that should be uh, visible over age right and so what that means is we should be able to detect race more easily in older patients and that's not true either you can do it with younger patients too so we we um 
have many other experiments that we have done and are doing to try to get at exactly where this information is coming from. But we uh, put this paper out, and it, it, uh, it had a little bit of uh, splashy media release, specifically because the FDA is clearing algorithms that work with x-rays. People release x-ray data sets, and it's, like, it's just a picture, right? If a model can tell perfectly, perfectly people, almost, that uh, this x-ray belongs to a black person, it could perfectly discriminate against black people if you wanted it to, and you would have no way of knowing, because you can't tell, because human experts cannot tell. And so I'll, I'll stop with my, like, it, I'm still shocked by it. I hope you can tell, like, as a machine learning person, I am still shocked by this. So this is, this is part of, uh, I, we, we discover things like this, and it's concerning, because I think we, we as a, community haven't figured out, as a human community, as a health community, as a machine learning community, haven't figured out to, how to deal with some of the superpowers that we might have. Like, it is a superpower to be able to predict this knee pain with a convolutional neural network better than humans have been able to. That was amazing. This paper uh, that Emma wrote, it's one of my favorite things to cite as a positive use of AI. What do we do with this other superpower? Did other people know before I did, and they've just like put out models that are super biased, and the rest of us just didn't know? Like, what do we do with this knowledge now? I think is is one of the questions. So I can I can follow up on that. I will. This is a striking result. This is I actually I remember where I was uh, when Marcia <laughs> called. She's like Emma. They have like very high AUC. And I'm like that's kind of weird. And then like a few months later, you know, the paper comes out, and the paper was even more stressful. So sometimes I like go go to my boyfriend like yeah, I'm just feeling stressed about Marcia's <laughs> paper. Anyway, so she's been making everyone miserable. I should um, tell you, <laughs> I've called like there's a set of junior, uh, mostly junior female machine learning faculty that I just called and was like, what do you think is going on here? <laughs> Emma is one of them. And they're like, there's no way. Try this. So it's, it was, I apologize. For we were all stressed. Yes. All right. We're, we're, all, we're all miserable together. OK, so, so what are we, we going to do about it? Um, so, so I think first, you know, I teach an intro to data science class. And, and you know, I, the, what I was telling the students on Monday is like, if you can get away with regression models, use regression models. Like, Math gets subtle, still waters run deep amazingly quickly. Two variables, you can get confused. Um, and so if you can get away with a regression model, do a regression model. Do not make deep learning your default. Uh, but, but that's not a complete solution, right? We're not going to stop using deep learning on medical images. It's just, it's just not, it's not feasible. We're not going to stop using nat natural language processing models. They're just too far ahead in terms of the state, state of the art. Uh, so, so what do we then do? I mean, I think one thing which is obvious is we need to make major strides in interpretability in machine learning. Like this is, you know, like we cannot just like have people stymied about what the hell is going on uh, with, with this. This is not an acceptable state of affairs. Um, and and I, I, I think another thing which is required is, is a deep level of humility. You know, the idea that we are dealing with animals we do not understand, with superpowers we really do not understand. And, you know, if that doesn't frighten you, I think you're not really understanding what, what you're playing with. Um, and, and so I think that's true. And I think a third thing is, you know, we need to continue to stringently audit for, for performance across subpopulations, right? So, 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 you know, these results certainly show that it is possible that it, for an insidious algorithm or an insidious algorithm designer, they could identify all the black patients in your data and, you know, do, do, do bad things on them. Uh, so, you know, you should be checking for that, right? As an external auditor, for example, you should be demanding access to race data and, and, and things like this to try and see uh, what is going on. Uh, but yeah. I don't know. I think the current state of affairs is a little bit nauseating. Makes me nervous. <laughs> that's, that's fun. But just to push back a little bit on that. So do they, well, mostly to agree, but to, to push a little, do they have to be insidious? Does the actor have to be insidious oh, no. for this? Oh, no. Yeah, can, too, can you explain that to us? Like, um, Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. No, what, no, no. what is the clinical meaning of this, of that finding? Like, that there is a ghost in the machine uh, of being able to learn race, even when we think race is not there. Yeah. The, like, oh, okay. Because um, the, the clinical meaning of that, I think, varies depending on who you ask. And I'm not a clinician, um, so I, I can give you a range of the answers that I've heard. Um, so the first is, I mean, the FDA clears algorithms, right? It clears devices. It does not currently require that medical devices and algorithms be audited across uh, known minority or minoritized subpopulations. 
maybe it should, right? So uh, there's, there's like one clinical meaning is like, maybe you need to check everything along these axes, uh, along these axes. Um, there are, there's honestly, like, there's two explanations. There's only two explanations that I can think of if you want to hear my, my hypotheses. One is that there is, um, you know, spectral interaction and in these uh, imaging modalities with melanin level. It's a possibility. It's self-reported race. It's not, you know, we don't have photos of people. And so it's possible that it's that. It's possible that there is... You know, humans take these x-rays, right, like x-ray techs, and they change the settings of the x-ray for every patient. It's possible, I don't, I don't even want to say it, it's so, it's so stressful, like, it's possible that, like, this runs so deep that every single time an x-ray tech images somebody who self-reports their race as African American, they indetectable, you know, indetectably to them, but detectable to the model, misalign or, you know, wrote, you know, put in the parameters of the machine in a way that it is detectable. That would really suck. It would be like saying, you can look at the way I write the word um, uh, recommendation uh, for all of the students I ever recommend. You could look at my handwriting, look at the way that I wrote the word recommendation by hand and tell whether the patient was white or black, the student was white or black based on that. That's what it would mean, right? It would mean that there's something so subtle about this, these tiny ways in which I am generating this artifact that are conveying something about me as a person and how I uh, feel or my, the precision with which I am doing something. So like clinically what that means is we need to uh, figure out, so we're, we're currently running studies to uh, try to match uh, skin color with, with patients so that we can actually figure out if there is some effect and then also concurrently looking at metadata affiliated with the x-rays that we have. But like as a clinician, I, I think uh, the thing I would like you to worry about is when you're using a model or when you're generating the data that will be used by a model, what do you think it can tell about a patient? And is it okay if the model can tell that about a patient? Because radiologists often just don't know. Right? Like I've, I've talked to a bunch of them now. I'm like, do you often know this about the patient? Do you like look in the, no. They, they often get like a very basic description of the patient and what is being imaged. Um, and so if uh, a model is giving you guidance or intuition or just visualizing something for you, even if it's just doing visualization, you should be concerned about how and why it might be recommending or showing you even the things that it's showing. Because the other thing that I think we haven't touched on in depth in this panel, but that is a very big theme that many people have spoken about is, let's say your model's perfect. It's a beautiful model, it's perfect, it's not biased. But you use it in a biased way, meaning you only listen to it when it confirms your beliefs in cases uh, that are for a majority. And then you just, you know, only listen to its incorrect recommendations and anchor to it when it's uh, with a minority population. That's possible, right? All models are going to be wrong sometimes. Even if they're fairly wrong, let's say they're wrong 10% of the time for both men and women, if we're just thinking about gender. But you only listen to the wrong recommendations when it's in women. That's still bad, right? And so we also need to think about ways that we are presenting, because models will, there's no way to do something that's right all the time, no matter what. And so we need to think about ways to present decision makers with this advice that we're giving them in a way that it doesn't anchor them to incorrect recommendations, especially in, again, minorities or minoritized populations. I think something really important that, that you just mentioned and, and Raji also mentioned is the lack of need of insidiousness, right? It doesn't have to be a bad actor. It doesn't have to be a bad actor designing the model. It doesn't have to be a bad actor interpreting the model, it, it doesn't have to be. You can just interpret it. And there are things that are happening behind the scenes, either in the model development or in the interpretation of, of the patient sitting directly in front of you that may lead one way or the other. So to Emma's point on humility, I think it's really, really important that we be super humble as we are dealing with this new technology that is built in some ways, 
we often understand it. Sometimes we don't necessarily have deep understanding behind it. And then that we have humility in conveying it to the physician and to the patient that is ultimately going to be affected by this, this model in, in some way, shape, or form. I, I just want to clarify, I don't think that it's clinicians are being insidious either. Just want to put that out there for the sake of the audience and my little sister, et cetera, et cetera. I think yeah, bias is generally <laughs> yeah, yeah. agreed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, terrific. So I think we have about uh, a little over five minutes. So maybe we can start with um, questions from uh, the audience here uh, and uh, any, any potential uh, questions that are uh, coming from our online audience as well. Thank you all. It was fascinating um, to listen to all three of you speak. Um, I'm in the Department of Biostatistics at the Chan School across the street. Whenever I think about bias, I think of it as a relative notion, as relative to some ground truth. That's often how biostatisticians at least think about bias in their analysis procedures, what have you. I'm curious what your thoughts are on whatever the sort of ground gold truth is when you guys speak about algorithmic bias. Like when you invoke that term bias, I automatically think, well, bias relative to what? And I'm just curious how you guys, each of you, conceptualize that. Um, I can start. I, I guess what I would say is when I, when I talk about bias in specific contexts, I try and define very specifically what I mean because what it means in, in policing is very different uh, than what it means in COVID testing is very different than what it means in mortality prediction. And it's not even really necessarily defined relative to a ground truth, right? If your natural language model is learning that like women belong in the kitchen, like what's the ground truth about where people belong, right? So like there, there are representational biases, there are biases in sort of the supervised learning context. And I think in general, uh, because of the degree of sort of heat that can surround this issue, it's, it's quite important to be very clear about the specific context you're talking about and how exactly you're defining bias in that context. Uh, so hi, so I'm a, a geneticist at Boston Children's Hospital, and so I do work in ELSI, like the ethical and the social implications of genomics, and there's, I guess my question is about governance. So I think about, um, you know, as a technology, you know, gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9, and we do it in somatic cells, and we cure diseases, and there's all this governance around not using it in germ lines, or, um, you know, same with kind of stem cell type of research. I guess as you're talking about this, just thinking you have this technology, and it's kind of you know, simplistically good and bad ways to use it. And so I'm wondering, is there like any type of governance structure kind of over the use of this kind of machine learning, similar to there is in, in some of the biological um, areas like CRISPR-Cas9 and governance over not using it for germline? No, there, there is not. Um, in some application areas, right, there, uh, so you know, if we're talking about like air traffic control, right, like the FTC cannot, can obviously govern how algorithms are used in that space. But just in general on machine learning as a whole, there is not. I, I do think that this, um, the start of the ethical review process by some of the conferences was an effort to sort of start that. But again, there's, uh, there are large factions within the community that say like technology is technology and you should do it, you, you should advance technology um, no matter what, right? Even if the only current foreseeable and future foreseeable to the expert ethical reviewer uh, potential uses are negative, like maybe it's still fine, right? Because it's, it's technology. Do we have uh, any online questions? We have time for maybe one more, one or two more. One question from an anonymous UX Channel View <laughs> audience member that is quite related to the last question. So even if there's no, or this is paraphrased, even if there's no governance around the application of machine learning ethically in healthcare today, what would you see as the role of legislators and regulators ideally in addressing bias predictive algorithms? Um, I, I can tell you what I'd like to see. I mean, I, I think I've said a little bit of this already, right? I, I would like to see guidance um, either 
optional gold star guidance or actually enforceable rules and legislation on ensuring that models uh, and devices in general, and this is not just models, right? Like we saw during COVID that those little O2 sensors don't work well on darker skin, exactly when you need them to, when the oxygenation level is low. So uh, it would be nice if there were guidelines um, or again, regulations around how you need to audit your model. Because again, I, I think you must have heard and seen my incredulity, my incredulity at my graduate students, you know, results about detecting race in the X-ray. I, I did not think it was possible, and so I think there are many other people also who probably don't think there's no way that this model is going to be different across these different groups. There's no way that there will be some sort of problem. Um, I don't, I don't think that you just aren't thinking about it, right? Especially if you are a technical person who is working with uh, data that you don't normally generate yourself. And so I do think that there is a, a big positive role for regulatory agencies to play in giving us some guidance here, right? Um, I, I think it also would benefit from this sort of uh, wider arena of expertise, right? So I did not know that in many of the data sets that we have, for example, especially here in Boston, that some self-reported race is more consistent. So if you track a patient, one patient, through all of their hospital stays and look at what race they self-report, some self-reportings um, are consistent. Like if you are, uh, for example, if you ever self-report that you are African-American, you almost always self-report that every time you come in. But there are other self-reportings that are less consistent. And so just even knowing that, right, like knowing when a variable tends to be reported in a certain way or not, and whether you should or should not use it in a model, depending on, again, for example, the outcome that you're looking at and whether it should even be part of that is, is something that I would like some broader uh, advice on. Maybe just to add to that, I think that it's, it is really important to get the advice, but we should also think about who is making the advice and kind of having the cross-functional community and the people that are going to be affected by the regulation. Because just, not, not that this would happen, but necessarily completely moving in one direction and saying nothing's okay or completely moving in a different direction and saying everything's okay isn't going to help us. So, so we need a, that nuanced approach. And frankly, this type of conversation, it's, it's hard. We, we don't have really good answers to any of, of these questions, but ha just having the conversation moves us forward. Great. I, I think that's a great note to end on. So please join me in thanking our panelists.